Okay, so I'm going to explain now how do we, how can we dynamically increase uh, sample sizes in a way that leads to convergence. And I'm going to do it in two parts. First, I'm going to assume that we know, someone tells us what the true gradient is. If I knew what the true gradient is, would I know how to steer my algorithm using <clears throat> a dynamic sample size? <clears throat> okay, so let's call j the true objective function that we want to minimize and grab j is the true gradient and whatever that means all the samples or the big big sample size problem and capital and, and lowercase g is a stochastic gradient approximation to it now we would like to have descent we would like the true gradient and the stochastic gradient to be pointing in the same half space that would give us descent i could try to work conditions like this but I wouldn't get very far because an angle condition like this, I don't know how to express it in terms of statistical uh, estimation conditions. So instead of that, I'm gonna propose a different measure on how to compare the true gradient and the stochastic gradient. And I have not seen this in the literature. Um, maybe it's somewhere, and if you've seen it, please let me know. So the way it's gonna work is as follows. We're gonna measure this quantity here. So g is something I compute. I know what it is. The exact gradient, I don't know what, it, what that is. But I would like, in principle, for this difference to be less than a constant less than 1 times the stochastic gradient. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to impose that condition. If I impose that condition, it is very easy to show. And I gave it in, to, in my final exam of the optimization class, because it could be done in two minutes to show that if this great norm condition is satisfied, then you also satisfy the angle condition. So uh, this, let me call it the theta condition, implies that the stochastic gradient is pointing in a descent direction with respect to the true objective function. But this quantity now is now one that I'm going to be able to measure. So in particular, if you bring the norm of g to the <clears throat> denominator, and you look at that quantity here, what is this true gradient? Well, it's the expected value of the stochastic gradient. So I'm going to be able to do estimates, statistical estimates of this quantity. And now, no longer guarantee that every time I could produce a descent direction, but guarantee that I produce a descent direction sufficiently often so that I will get to the solution. OK, so that, that is the condition we would like to impose. Now, assuming that I can satisfy that condition, let's, for the purposes of just this discussion, forget about Newton methods, forget about second order and everything, and let's just consider a gradient method. If I cannot do a dynamically sampled algorithm with a true gradient method, I won't be able to do it with anything. So let's try a very simple steepest descent iteration with a fixed step length. L is the Lipschitz constant. And it is known that for a convex function, if you take a steepest descent direction with that step length, it gives you descent at every time and you get convergence. So now let's put an approximate gradient. So the following result holds by replacing the true gradient of the objective function with a stochastic gradient that satisfies that condition here for any theta less than 1. So if you're able to do that satisfy this condition at every iteration, then at every iteration of the algorithm, you can decrease the true objective by a linear fraction. OK, so let me try to hand wave um, what we're doing here. I'm computing a stochastic gradient. If the stochastic gradient is not good, I'm going uphill. I'm never going to get to the solution. But suppose that there is an oracle. Someone is going to tell you whether the stochastic gradient that you computed is good enough with respect to the true gradient to satisfy that condition there. The norm of the stochastic gradient minus the norm of the true gradient is less than the norm of the stochastic gradient itself. So someone is going to tell you if that is tr true. If it is not true, then you're going to increase the sample size until the stochastic gradient satisfies that condition. So we choose it at random. If at every iteration I'm able to satisfy this inequality, then I'm going to be able to decrease the objective function at every iteration, get a linear rate of convergence, and with that, uh, build a 
uh, complexity result. So in particular, if you have a bound like that, you're decreasing the objective function by a fixed constant, then uh, for a uniformly convex function, the number of iterations to get an epsilon uh, accurate solution is going to look like 1 over epsilon. As Steve Wright presented a bunch of results of this form, and um, this is mainly for theoretical purposes. OK, now, that's not possible. Nobody's going to tell me if my stochastic gradient satisfies a certain condition with respect to the true gradient. Let's try to see how to build probabilistic estimates where, to guarantee descent. OK, so ideally, I would like to impose this condition at every iteration. But as I mentioned, the two gradient is not computable. Therefore, we're going to estimate this difference using the sample variance in the stochastic gradient GK. So remember that the gradient is the sum of the gradients of loss functions. So I'm going to look at each one of these gradients as a red box in here. So I have a set of vectors, and I'm going to look at the variance between these vectors. Now, I'm going to look at it component-wise. So uh, let's look at the first component of the vector. So then I have cardinality of x times numbers. And I'm going to look at the sample variance of those numbers. And then I'm going to do it component by component. And the sample variance is going to be used to estimate that quantity there. All right, so here is the sample variance that now is using quantities that are computable. Here is my stochastic gradient. Here are the gradients of the component functions. And in experiments, I, I want to use this quantity to approximate the true difference between the gradient and the approximate gradient. In the test that we did for the speech problems, this ratio was always between 1 half and 2. So it was not a perfect estimate of whether you're satisfying the condition, but it, but it is within a factor of 2. OK, so in the algorithm, in an implementation, we're going to compute this uh, uh, standard deviation and impose for a given theta that it be less than the norm of the stochastic gradient. If it is not, then we increase the sample size until that is true. Now, we, th uh, we thought that this condition would be enough to give us convergence with probability. But it turns out that there are pathological cases where you may be missing the correct angle condition too often. So in order to do this analysis, uh, we're going to try to avoid the cases where we go uphill. In practice, it's never going to happen. But theoretically, it could happen that you pick an infinite number of bad Training points is going to give you bad uphill directions, and we have to rule it out. So I'm going to have to put something else here in this derivation. I'm going to try to estimate the probability that a bad step, meaning a step that gives you ascent, is generated. And I'm going to have to counteract that. OK. Some analysis shows that if you want to bound this ratio, which is our theta condition, our accuracy condition, by 1.2, um, that implies that you have this condition here. Um, this is equivalent to that. Now, if samples are normally distributed, the probability that my accuracy condition is satisfied, that the probability that this is violated, is given by the tail of the t distribution and can be shown to have an exponential form of 2 to the 1 minus the sample size nk. And I forgot to mention one thing here, is that to simplify the notation, I'm using uh, nk to denote the size of the sample xk, the cardinality of xk. OK, so I'm going to have to grow the sample size exponentially to make sure that that is true. And so to ensure that the sample size gets large enough for our gradient accuracy conditions to be valid, we need to impose that in practice, if the sample size is not growing at least exponentially, then I force it to grow exponentially. Now, I can make this constant to be very small, very conservative. So I have a very slow exponential behavior that it would only be active uh, 
um, if my variance conditions are not sufficient. So if we put these two conditions together, we can prove the following result, which is not going to be a result on iteration complexity, but on work complexity. What I mentioned, the total amount of work that we're going to do with a dynamic sample algorithm. So the result is as follows. Suppose again that J is uniformly convex function, and that we compute a stochastic gradient method, but let's not, let, let me not call it stochastic, let me call it mini batch. I haven't crossed the twilight zone. I'm still here with a large enough sample size that I can use one over L. I don't need diminishing gains. Then, eta k, if the size of the sample that I use to estimate the gradient gk is chosen so that the sample variance is less than the norm of the gradient, of that stochastic gradient, and if I ensure that in the worst case it's growing in some slow exponential way, then the number of gradient samples needed to achieve epsilon accuracy has this form here. So this is the total number of gradient samples means the total amount of work, the total amount of time that I touch the objective function. In a gradient algorithm, the, gradient the, the iteration itself is very cheap. What's expensive is the function evaluation. So now the number of gradient samples to achieve epsilon is given by a quantity that depends on the condition number of the problem, which is normal because I'm using steepest descent. Steepest descent gets worse with the condition number. M is the number of variables, so it depends linearly on the number of variables, and lambda is the smallest eigenvalue. It enters one more time there, not just the condition number, but the smallest eigenvalue, but it has an one over epsilon dependence. And this may be a little bit difficult to digest. I mean, I really cut through 10 pages of analysis in our paper to present those results. But what I want to do is slow down here and see if I can convey the information of this slide. Because there is a paper by, by Botu, Leon Botu and Bousquet that I really like a lot. And that I really like to attack too. Um, this, pap this paper by Botu and Bousquet has been interpreted by many people that I know as saying, for machine learning application, stochastic gradient descent is the best algorithm, computationally and theoretically. And the argument they give is a theoretical argument saying, don't bother with the mini batch methods, the stochastic method will win. And here's, here's the way their argument works. They're able to show that the work complexity, the total amount of work that a batch gradient method is going to do has this dependence here. Now that's a big constant, but there's an epsilon squared there. In the worst case, the total amount of work uh, is of the form one over epsilon squared, whereas for the stochastic gradient method is one over epsilon. Now, how small do we want epsilon to be? Well, we don't, we don't know, but theoretically, we want it to be small enough. So suppose that epsilon is 10 to the minus 6. This is 10 to the minus 12. And, and, and 1 over means that this is very bad. And the worst case is it depends on an estimation constant. In and, and, uh, Botu and Busquet paper, there is not a 2 here. There is an alpha that is somewhere between 1 and 2. But you can expect it to be greater than 1. And if you forget about all these constants, you see that there's a worse complexity analysis for the batch gradient method than for stochastic gradient method. And they do more. They say, uh, consider a Newton-like method. And let's imagine the best possible situation by which we can invert the matrix and much less work. And they give an analysis showing that a batch great, uh, Newton method also has worse complexity than stochastic gradient. And they also invent a stochastic Newton method and show that it has the worst complexity. So in that paper, in the Botu Bousquet paper, at the end there's a nice table where it pops up that the best method with the best complexity is the stochastic gradient method. But now here come the interesting news. That was for algorithms that use a fixed batch size. So stochastic gradient descent, 
that they analyzed used one sample point, and the batch method uses all the information. How about a method like the one I just described, where you start with a small sample size and keep increasing it as you progress? Shouldn't you be saving? And if we do that summation of all the work as the iteration progresses, what we obtain is a complexity bound of this form. And now it's interesting to compare that with a complexity bound for stochastic gradient descent. One over epsilon and one over epsilon. So that factor epsilon squared has disappeared. The advantage, the theoretical advantage of stochastic gradient descent has now disappeared by the use of dynamic sample sizes. Here we have condition number squared. Here we have the condition number. One can argue back and forth, but this bound is not worse than that bound. So this now opens now some possibility. Even theoretically, we can no longer claim stochastic gradient descent as the best bound. Dynamically, um, changing of the batch size gives you very good complexity. If you do it in this way with those probabil uh, probability estimates. And maybe the only graph I want to show you now, and this really corrects the graph that we have a while ago, is here is a method that uses dynamic sample sizes. It keeps increasing the sample size for x as it goes along, but also uses second order information. This is a dynamic Newton CG method. I just put it on top, replace the gradient iteration by the Newton CG, and keep updating things that way. Uh, here was the old LBFGS run, and here is a run with just 10% of the information that it sort of levels out. And what is very different between this graph and the one I showed you before, I don't know if you remember that before the Newton CG method started very close to LBFGS, to limited memory BFGS. And now the Newton CG method is starting really almost vertically shooting up, very similar to a stochastic method. But then it's able to use a larger accuracy in the solution if you, if you so want to. So now we've obtained combined second order information, subsampling, dynamic sample sizes, and we get a behavior of this form that is now significantly faster than um, on a sequential machine than the limited memory BFGF. OK, so I'm going to summarize a few things here. To compare methods for machine learning, in particular to compare stochastic and batch methods, it does not suffice to look at the convergence rate or the number of iterations. One must take into account the total cost of achieving a certain level of accuracy. We follow the approach of Botu and Bousquet in treating estimation and optimization together, and we found out that dynamic sample sizes make a measurable difference, theoretically, in establishing work complexity bounds and blur the lines about what theoretically is best. Stochastic gradient versus mini batch. So we'll create some opportunities there. So let me use up the rest of the time to talk about L1. If it's not clear from that slide. <laughs> How about if we add now a regularization term? Can you do Newton methods for methods that have regularization? This is no longer a smooth function. So how can I use a Newton method on a function that is a sum of a smooth convex function plus a non-differentiable term? It's hard if you do it the wrong way. It's really easy. It's going to be really easy if we just make a couple of observations. But what is it that a lot of people have done? Look at this function in its entirety and say, well, let me try to apply a Newton method directly on that. And then you get a lot of difficulties if you try to do it that way. OK, so I'm going to present two gener general approaches for tackling the regularized problem. How about if I rewrite it, first of all, as f of x. Now the variables are called x plus the one norm. And I also mentioned at the beginning of, these, um, of my talks that I could put other regularization terms here. But I want to obscure the notation. So why don't we just stay with a, the L1 norm? The Newton-like methods that I like for this problem come in two brands. One of them, let me call it the Newton-Lasso method, 
But people in nonlinear programming would call it the sequential quadratic programming method. What it does, it makes a piecewise quadratic approximation to that problem there and computes an approximate step of this piecewise quadratic model. I will describe it in detail. That's approach number one. Approach number two is sort of divide and conquer, is apply a two-phase method that first says, look, if you look at Rn, the, uh, the absolute value function in Rn is only non-differentiable if you cross from positive to negative. But if you stay within an orthand of Rn, this function is smooth. So in the two-phase methods, what you do is you apply a certain iteration that tells you stay on this orthon and minimize a function in that orthon. And the function is smooth there. So you can apply your Newton method there. Now, the orthon is not really an orthon. It's an orthon phase. In other words, the algorithm is not going to tell me just minimize in this orthon. It may tell me actually to minimize along this line here that starts at zero and goes to infinity. And this type of quantity in geometry is called an orthon phase, the phase of an orthon. OK, so in the two-phase method, well, actually, I have a better slide for that. So first of all, let's look at the Newton-Lasso method, um, or sequential quadratic programming. I have a convex non-quadratic function plus the L1 term make a quadratic approximation to f. Here's the quadratic approximation. What is b? Well, b could be the exact Hessian. Could be a subsampled Hessian. Could be the identity. Well, that's not very interesting. Could be a quasi-Newton approximation. But we make a quadratic model of the smooth function f. And then we just leave the L1 term there. Why do we leave the L1 term there? Well, actually, we made a quadratic approximation of this term, too. But it's linear. So the quadratic approximation is just the term itself. <clears throat> now, this problem here is a quadratic plus an L1 term. Steve Wright spent a lot of time telling us that this is lasso problem can be solved, for instance, by iterative shrinkage. It's perfectly designed to solve that problem. Or you could use the FISTA algorithm. So now we have two layers. We have our convex optimization problem with L1. I create a second layer, which is a quadratic model plus L1. And now I can tackle that directly with ISTA. And suppose for a moment that I solve this problem exactly with ISTA. Then I would obtain an exact Newton method. So I solve this exactly, um, and then I will do a line search, will iterate, or so on. Now, some people propose not to use ISTA, but to, to use coordinate descent on that problem. Do you remember? You go up like that. And there are some applications where this makes sense. And I'm going to talk about inverse covariance estimation. And there, one can be very clever at working with these complicated matrices. And coordinate descent will also work. But in general, coordinate descent will not minimize this finitely. So it may not be that productive. And you can use other methods. There is a method proposed by Dostal that we've been analyzing recently. It's another method for solving this kind of problem. And it has very attractive properties. Uh, this method of Dostal is one that is like an adaptive conjugate gradient method that knows uh, when to stop the conjugate gradient iteration. OK, so one general, th this is one general way of tackling things. And then I don't have to explain anymore. According to me, I'm done at this point. So if you want to solve the L1 problem, you produce this quadratic model there. You solve it with ISTA or FISTA. Let's say that would be the best attractive things. That gives you a step. You do a line search, you move, and, and then you're done. And what you do in this case is you don't try to do any smooth approximation of the problem, but you relegate all the work to your iterative thresholding iteration which is like a good gradient method for doing that. We have coded this. I'm going to show you some results later on. This is a very, very robust way of attacking things. Now, here is the alternative approach, this orthon-based method. And I'm going to give you two ways in which this method can work. 
So uh, probably the best thing is to start with a picture. Suppose the initial estimate is here. Here is xk. We're going to compute the steepest descent direction for this objective function here. What is the steepest descent direction? We're going to define it as the minimum norm subgradient. The minimum norm subgradient of this function, which was written repeatedly in Steve Wright's slides, um, well, when x is positive, if you, look, if you look at these terms here and write the L1 term as a sum of terms, if one component is positive, of course, its derivative is just 1. So the partial would be the gradient of f plus 1 times nu. And if it's negative, it's minus 1 times nu. And in other cases, it's 0 when the gradient of f is less than uh, in absolute value than nu. So I compute the minimum norm subgradient of this function here, which is easily computable, and I'm writing here in red. In the first approach that I call the infinitesimal search, you just see in what direction is that minimum subgradient pointing. If it points like this, then you declare this to be the orthon in which you will be working. If this red line was actually on the x-axis, then you would be holding the y variable at 0, and you would be minimizing on that orthon phase. So depending on how that works, and in general, some of the components of the subgradient, of the minimum norm subgradient, are going to be 0, and others are not going to be. So some variables are going to be held fixed, and other variables you're allowed to move. And then you just apply the Newton CG method on the smooth problem. I write it like this. But now we know that in an orthant, this is going to have, it's going to be either plus or minus, and I'm, I'm going to be able to know how to write the absolute value. So each one of the components in here in an orthant is going to be just plus x or minus x, and some variables are zero. And the variables are zero are going to be held fixed. Those, they, they are the variables that are held fixed. And uh, apply Newton CG, subsamples, quasi Newton, anything you want, you can apply here. And that, and that method will work well, provided you do an intelligent search, line search. So in the first method that I showed, the Newton-Lasso method, the line search is going to be less critical. And this method is going to be very important. And um, I think the picture is going to show things clearly. xk is the current iterate. Suppose that the minimum norm subgradient is pointing this way. So it's telling us to work on this orthant. I apply the Newton CG algorithm on this orthant where the function is smooth. And suppose that the conjugate gradient step goes this way. Now, by the way, that you're computing the minimum norm subgradient doesn't mean that you use it. You don't move along that direction. You just use it to identify the orthant. So you're at xk. You don't move from xk. You compute the Newton CG step. And suppose it goes that way. So in this case, I let the conjugate gradient iteration run, exit the orthant where I'm working with. And after I'm finished with my conjugate gradient iteration, we perform a, back, a projected backtracking line search. So we want to make sure that the new iterate is in the orthant where you started. So we take the CG step, project it onto the orthant, and then do a backtracking line search like that. What is important about this backtracking line search is that in the L1 problem, we want to identify the zero variables as quickly as possible. And if you didn't do that projected search, if you stop the CG iteration early, uh, you would have a lot of variables that are non-zero. And in this projected search, you're going to pick up a lot of variables, force them to zero, and then redo the computation again. Um, <clears throat> OK, this is the way I write the projected uh, backtracking line search. But I don't think we need to understand the details, because th the official picture is, is as follows. Just to repeat, you compute the CG step, project it onto the orthant, and then look at this trajectory here, which is the projection of the CG line onto the orthant. You do a backtracking line search until you get a decrease in the function. And that algorithm is, is um, a Newton-like method, a very reasonable Newton-like method. And such an algorithm has been implemented. There is an impl implementation at Google. There's a MapReduce implementation. I'll show you some numbers. And it's pretty good at um, 
bringing sparsity down. But there is an orthon-based method that I like better. And if I had thought about it before, we would have done this MapReduce implementation instead of the one that I mentioned with the infinitesimal line search. I'm going to call this a second order iterative thresholding, a second order ISTA method. Now, is it legitimate to call this the second order ISTA method? Well, I don't know. Steve Wright is going to tell me at the end whether it is or not. Suppose this is XK. The way this algorithm works is compute one iteration of ISTA at this point. How does the ISTA iteration look like? It looks like that, like a piecewise trajectory. When you do the soft thresholding, it looks like that. So depending on the step length that you choose, the ISTA iteration may tell you to stay here on this orthon, or to stop here, or to exit the orthon. Let's suppose for the sake of the discussion that the ISTA iteration starting at this orthon takes you to this other orthon. And this can be many orthons away. So ISTA tells you to go over here. And in that orthon that ISTA has identified, you now compute a Newton CG step. The function is smooth. Apply whatever tools you want, subsampled Hessian or full Hessian or whatever. You compute a second order step. And then we're going to do the same thing. If this step exited the orthon identified by ISTA, I do a projected backtracking line search. If it's in this picture, the CG step is inside the orthon identified by ISTA, I take that step. So um, you take the smooth problem, you do a projected backtracking line search, and you have a second order method for solving um, the L1 problem. And for those of you who are very familiar with nonlinear programming, there's a very nice analogy between the two classes of methods I described and the sequential quadratic programming method and sequential linear quadratic programming that are two important ways of solving nonlinear programs. In the sequential quadratic programming method, you're instantaneously looking at changes in the active set. And in gradient projection, two-phase gradient projection or sequential linear quadratic programming, you first explore, find the phase, make the problem simpler there, apply a second order method there, and repeat it. So both approaches have show promise. They're fairly new. They've been applied only in some applications. The two-phase ISTA method is going to have easy convergence properties, whereas the, the instantaneous approach is dubious. I don't know. There is a proof for that method, but the proof is incorrect. I don't have a counterexample. It is unknown whether the infinitesimal line search really works. But an ISTA line search will work. Uh, and here is a result of a method of this kind. And we're comparing it not with a first order. If, if you compare this method with a pure ISTA, it beats it by a huge margin. So what we're going to do here is compare two orthon methods, one that uses a quasi-Newton approximation and is implemented in a, a code called OWL that became quite popular for some time. It does a limited memory approximation of sorts. There is an issue there about it doesn't really do a minimization on a subspace. It does a projection. But in any case, this is a well-known orthon-based method to use a second-order information, and it is a Newton CG method. And what I'm plotting here is not the function evaluation, but the number of non-zeros. We start at zero, and um, the Newton method is better able at bringing down, at producing zero elements faster. But the nightmare. Of all these methods, always the nightmare of all the methods that I am describing, that I'm proposing, that I'm promoting, is that there's always a stochastic way to do that. And stochastic methods have their magic on uh, machine learning problems. So I, instead of just comparing two batch-like methods and showing how good this Newton CG method is, how about if you try to compare it with the best stochastic method that I know for the L1 problem. Well, one of the best methods for the L1 problem is the nestor of dual averaging method that Steve described. Um, I just have a slide here. You may or may not remember it. But what the slide shows is that it's a very simple method. It takes 
one stochastic gradient every time. One sample point compare, compares the, computes the gradient of one, uh, the gradient of one sample point, and adds it to some average, and then computes a very simple iteration. And the method uses some averaging. Now the averaging, as Steve was describing, may interfere with sparsity considerations, so you may not want to implement the averaging step. In summary, what I'm doing here is trying to use pure stochastic gradient descent on that problem. You cannot use pure stochastic method on that. You have to use a version that takes into account the effect of the L1 norm. And this um, regularized dual averaging method does that. It's assigned for L1 problems. And see what happens when I ran it on a sequential machine, when we ran it on a sequential machine, and compare it with our Newton-like method. And what I'm plotting now here is the objective function. We want to maximize classification. And on the x-axis is the total amount of work again. Here's the Newton CG algorithm with all the tools that I have. Now it has dynamic sampling for the function and the gradient. It has Hessian sampling. And that's why you see this jagged behavior here because it's changing its sample size as it goes along. So this is the best thing that we have, and the stochastic method still wins. The dual averaging method on a sequential machine still wins. This is really great stuff. That we have stochastic methods and we have the batch methods, and stochastic methods uh, are really, really well tuned. They work so well. They you know, both of them start really, really fast. But it's somehow the stochastic method is able to do more productive work here. And on this logistic problem, this is again the speech recognition problem I described a while ago, it beats the Newton CG method. So I we would give up here, except that from the very beginning, the reason why we looked at second order methods is because they have the opportunity for parallelism. These are results on a sequential machine. Now, I don't have results on a parallel machine comparing these two methods. Now, clearly, parallelizing stochastic dual averaging is hard. And there's a paper by Ducci about that. And Steve described that. And there's a lot of interest right now in parallelizing stochastic methods. But a batch method, we know how to parallelize. We just parallelize the function evaluation. Now, since I don't have a MapReduce or a GPU implementation, what we did is a crude estimate. How would this graph change if we got some degree of parallelism in the function evaluation? And in the following graph, what I have is a redrawing of the curve to make, show things more clearly. Here is a stochastic dual averaging method. And here is the run for the Newton CG method, giving myself credit assuming that I can speed up the function evaluation by a factor of 5 or by a factor of 10. And so if you can speed it up by a factor of 5 or 10, then you can uh, improve upon that method. This is very crude. This is a, a theoretical parallel computing uh, exercise to see where you can go. Now, it's complicated because the, the methods that I'm plotting here have dynamic batch sizes for functions and gradients. So parallelism is complicated. So uh, to get a speed up of 5 or 10 in the function evaluations is easy for a full batch. But for a sampling, I don't know how it is. So until we don't have an implementation, we will not know what it is. Right? So these second order methods for the L1 problem look attractive. Stochastic methods are still the competition. The jury's still out there. There's ample of room for experimenting and for us in optimization to look at methods of this kind. And um, I am almost done. Now there's a big thing about complexity, and you're going to say, oh, no more of this stuff. I just want to uh, make a few final remarks about, about complexity. In the last hour, I have been challenging some widely accepted conclusions about the theoretical efficiency of first and second order methods in machine learning. The previous analysis, for instance, in the paper of Botou and Bousquet, has bypassed 
interesting classes of methods. So it looks at stochastic gradient descent and batch gradient. It has looked at Newton method, batch Newton method, and an idealized stochastic Newton method. But it has not considered what has been the theme of all these con of the three hours that I've spoken here, and that is that there are methods that lie in between first and second order methods. Um, that was not considered in the previous analysis. And more importantly, that analysis did not consider the possibility of using dynamic sample sizes. We showed that by measuring the total amount of work in an algorithm that changes the sample size, we can get theoretical estimates of the work complexity that are no worse than stochastic gradient. So now someone has to come and show that we did something wrong or they're doing a better analysis of stochastic gradient in order for stochastic gradient to pull ahead. But theoretically, it's not ahead based on the analysis. And by the way, this uh, analysis that I presented here on dynamic sample sizes has just been published in math programming. Uh, pr uh, current issue of math programming has that paper. So you can see all the details there. Now, in addition to that, the theory does not consider parallel computing environments. What theory? Well, the theory of Botu and Bousquet and the one that we presented does not com consider parallel computing. Uh, people are looking into that, and that is going to also change the game. It depends on the environment where you are. What is it about machine learning that makes optimization a little bit different? Well, there is a stochastic nature of it. There's a finite variance that is going to be the important property. But let me now just summarize the observations about the three errors that occur in machine learning and where optimization is and where the balance should be. Ideally, we would like to place a, a phrase the problem as follows. Training points are pairs uh, in an input-output space that is endowed with some probability distribution. Now, we don't know what that probability distribution is, but what we want to do is we want to make predictions. We have predicted output y and real output, uh, uh, predicted output y hat and real output y. And we're going to, we always have loss functions that measure the discrepancy between the two of them. So if I have a probability space like that, then I can talk about the expected risk. And now I'm following notation of Botu and Bousquet. The expected risk would be this integral, right, over the probability function. And what is important here is that if the prediction function that I'm using is always going to be restricted to some classes of functions. So there is going to be a um, limitation by the class of prediction functions that one uses. Now, given that, the goal is to find the function within that class, that minimizes the expected risk. But we can't consider all possible classes, so we're not going to find the optimal. We're going to find it in a, in, a, in a manifold. So here is the expected risk. Since we don't know the probabilities, in practice, one uses the empirical risk, and one is making a second level of approximation. The first level of approximation comes from the fact that we're using a certain class of prediction functions. The second one is, comes from the fact that we're using empirical minimization. And the third comes from the fact that the optimization is not done accurately. The first one is called approximation error, estimation error, and optimization error. And we need to balance the three. And a good complexity analysis is going to take the three things into account. And this is why when we do uh, optimization for machine learning applications, it doesn't make sense to do exact optimization. Because to bring down this error beyond those two errors does not, does not make sense. Now, we don't know what these errors are. So empirically, one can work on a test set, uh, what is called holdout set, look at generalization error, that will somehow take into account these two terms. Um, and then adjust the optimization according to that. But even if we cannot get that rate of convergence, I should mention that. Uh, the rate of convergence of optimization algorithms is always important because 
it affects the performance of the algorithm globally. So it is not true just that Newton's method converges more quickly to the solution once it gets near there than steeper descent. Newton's method starts making better progress to the solution from the very beginning. So even if you don't have accurate optimization, it makes sense to have algorithms that know how to deal with curvature. Now, to have algorithms that know how to deal with local minima versus global minima, that's a much harder question. And I, never, I didn't even touch it here. I have no idea what that is. But in te terms of curvature, whether the problem is convex or non-convex, <clears throat> you want to be able to have algorithms that exploit, that learn curvature. And here, just uh, as a final thing, is the table in uh, Botou and Bousquet showing the complexity of different methods, Newton and so on, and um, the observation that we're able to squeeze in between dynamic sample sizes and change the panorama here. OK, so I'm going to finish now with the following um, practical implementation. I'm going to apply Newton CG methods for regularized sparse covariance matrix estimation. There is no time to get into details, but in the sparse inverse covariance estimation problem, uh, one is given an empirical sample covariance matrix, S, was generated by uh, uh, random IID points XI. It's assumed that the mean is known. And we generate a sample covariance matrix. And the problem consists of finding an inverse to that matrix that is as sparse as possible. If you look at the maximum likelihood uh, um, formulation of the problem, the, it consists of finding a matrix P that maximizes this maximum likelihood function and has an L1 term in order to try to make this function as sparse as possible. OK, so now we have a matrix optimization problem. You really want the matrix P also to be positive definite, but the log debt term is going to make sure of that. It's like a barrier function, so we're not going to have to do it with a constraint formulation. So if you have a problem like this, is there any way to apply all the stuff that we learned now? Can we apply Newton methods? Can we apply subsampling? Can we apply dynamic batch sizes and so on? Well, it's an L1 problem. So I can use one of my two general methodologies, Newton lasso or Orthon methods, and then apply Newton CG there. The only difference now is that we're making with matrix. The, the variables are matrices, not vectors. But well, that's a nuisance. If you compute the functions and the gradients, you can uh, tackle that problem. I've written here the optimality conditions for this problem here. This is the optimal solution. There is the inverse. There is the empirical covariance matrix. And z is a, a vector of dual variables that has this form. Here are the optimality conditions of the problem. But we're going to tackle this as if it's any other problem. So now my colleagues at IBM, um, Peter Olson and Stephen Rennie, they have computed derivatives for this um, function for this matrix function, first derivative, second derivatives, third derivatives, fourth derivatives. And, uh, and they said, well, ca how can we use them? And I said, well, I don't know. I only know how to use second derivatives. So why don't we do a Newton-like method for solving this problem? And we're going to do Hessian vector products and CG and so on. Before this work, the most common methods for solving the inverse covariance matrix problems were first order methods. Block coordinate descent. Steve talked about that. Maybe not just one variable, but you move a set of variables at the time. There are three codes that do that. Projected subgradient methods, the famous alternating linearization method, or ADMM method. Those were considered until recently to be really, really good ways of solving the inverse covariance matrix problem. And there, there's a recent paper, came out a year or two, by uh, Dylan at Texas and um, his collaborators, where he uses a certain kind of second order method. Um, and what we will do is we will apply our general methodology, Newton CG. Now, in this method that the Texas group of Dylan did, 
they use a coordinate relaxation iteration, coordinate descent, in order to solve subproblems. And I mentioned at the beginning there's limitations, uh, very severe limitations at using coordinate descent methods. So that method works only for problems that are very well aligned. OK, so if you give me first derivatives, Hessian vector product, I don't, it, it's, it, it's not important that the functions, that the variables are matrices. We can apply exactly the same algorithms, just change your objects. And I'm going to report here the results. And this is the last slide. Results for the sparse inverse covariance matrix problem using the alternating method of multipliers and using a Newton CG method. In particular, this is an orthon based method of the second kind. Um, we compute Hessian vector products by coding them as before. Um, here's values for the regularization parameter. We have done extensive experiments with many different kinds of sparsity and different kinds of problems. And here are some typical results. The alternating direction method, 161 seconds versus 4 seconds and 212 seconds versus 26. And that is for a problem with 500 variables. If you start increasing the number of variables, things get really bad for the alternating direction method to the point that we were able to solve problems with 2,000 variables using the Newton CG approach in a matter of 10 minutes. But the ADMM method was not able to go beyond, much beyond the 500 variables that we have without running for days. Now, there's, there are not many different ways of implementing the ADMM method, but it has the possibility for parallelism. And right now, these are sequential results. Both methods can be parallelized. So function evaluations, Hessian vector products can be parallelized. The Newton C iteration can be parallelized, and the ADM method can be parallelized. So this experiment has to be repeated for a parallel computing environment. And one can say this is not a, a definitive argument for saying you know, the second order methods are definitely the way to go. But this is a definitive argument to say that the second order methods are methods to be considered, that they are there in the competition. So thank you very much for uh, your attention.